Greetings, and bienvenue, made crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. Hey, X. I was wondering if any other users here live in or around Northeast Pennsylvania. I live kinda close to the New York line. I used to live outside Philadelphia but traveled up into Monroe County into the Poconos fairly often. So, when I moved to Wayne County it wasn't too awful of a move. The issue was actually coming to terms with the fact that I lived there. I live in the middle of the woods and honestly it's often dull. I cut logs and make fires, drink and shoot. There are a lot of farmlands and dairy cow farms around here. Not much human contact if I or my family don't go into town. Town being 30 minutes away. So, I went from streetlights and cars 24-7, to next to nothing, and I started to notice more shit around me. I like to stay out sometimes at night, I smoke and find doing it out on my back deck at night really calming and chill. Recently it's been getting warmer so I can't wait to do it again soon. Anyway. Let me share a story. This was probably about three years ago. I've always been a night owl and often spend the night either in my room or out on the deck. It was a night I was out on deck I started to hear stepping around in the darkness. The back deck faces just woodland, so I started to look around out in the dark. It's maybe 100 yards out that my backyard turns into unmanaged woodland. I saw glowing eyes kinda stalking through the thinner edge of the wood in front of the deck. I always saw deer and some coyotes out there so that's what I assumed it was. I went inside and grabbed a mag light that sat right next to the door. Hit the button and shone it on the spot with the reflecting eyes. Nothing, not a damn thing. Turn light off, eyes, turn on, none. So, pretty messed up I turned the outdoor lights on nothing there at all, kept them for the rest of the night while I was on edge inside. Went out the next morning and found just a few snapped twigs. Pittsburgh resident here. In Pittsburgh, there are tunnels downtown, big weird ones. I worked at a sandwich place in the city hall building on a grant. If you took a freight elevator down, there was a locked gate, with a padlock, like on a fence. My boss had a key and took me down one day. He stored all of his extra stuff down there paper towels, ranch dressing bottles, chips, etc. It looked like a big concrete room ceilings about 8 or 9 feet high. I thought it was just this weird little room but he smiled and was like, check this out. So we walked through the little storage room and it kept going. It was a long tunnel. I asked him what it was slash what it was for and he kind of just shrugged. He said the tunnels ran under downtown, and he had a sandwich shop across the street in the courthouse, and the tunnels ran to that store as well. We got to a point where the tunnels split in two different directions after like a minute of walking, and he was like, let's get back to work. I have no idea what these tunnels are, where you can access them, or why we stored chips in them. So weird. I live in the Poconos like 45 minutes south of Scranton. So there's this road called Hip Sea Gap Road that people have died on and shit like that. A hunter disappeared up there and was found shot. And there's a story that people were led out there and shot execution style. The road is like decaying and full of potholes and the forest around it is thick as fuck since it leads up a mountain. The bridge is the worst. It's creepy as fuck and dark as fuck. Played Ouija board up there a few times and got some really creepy shit. Generally it scares the shit out of people. There's just bad energy up there. Pick related it's the bridge. There's no point in dragging my owl man story out. Me and some buds go on a yearly trip in June to a hunting cabin my uncle lets us use. We thought it would be cool to tube down a river in the middle of the night. Pretty stupid considering rattlesnakes are active at night, but whatever. If you're familiar with Lycoming County, you've probably heard of the Pine Creek. It's about 10.30 at night, me and three other buddies are just floating and chilling. 
we started to hear weird ass noises and snapping of limbs from the nearby shore. This went on for an hour, but everyone was fucking plastered. I would have been too, but I needed to find the source of the noise or at least see something. I did fucking see something. Fucking eyes in a large tree, 30 feet off the ground. When I made eye contact it let out an ungodly screech and flew towards us. I don't scare easily, but fuck. This thing went off and on, swooping at us and fucking hollering for an hour. We were too scared to get our asses out of the tube. It eventually stopped after we took shelter under a bridge. Never dared to go back. Got a decent look at it. Looks like the picture I attached. Lancaster here, I've heard a bunch of stories and seen many tours, but the story I remember most clearly is in Gettysburg for this elementary school. The gist of the story is that there was this fifth grade class around like 2010 and it was during a history lesson. Ironically but there was this confederate soldier that walked into the class during the lesson and didn't say anything for like five minutes while the teacher is trying to find out who he is and the kids were all confused. The teacher apparently called down the principal and when she got to the classroom. She tried like touching him to get his attention and the guy let out a deathly high pitched scream and like flew or ran, forget this part but doesn't really matter, down the middle of the aisle between the desks and ran through the wall. That's all the story I remember and I think there was another part to it, but I forget the rest of it, but Gettysburg if you stay around at night for a while you can have a good chance of some crazy shit. In Delco, Archbishop Prendergast High School is haunted. I went to the boys' school next to it, it's all girls. We used to have practice there for the plays and a couple classes. The building was first built by a man named Fallon, a huge weird octagonal mansion called Runnymede. It was purchased by St. Catherine Drexel's dad, and it burned to the ground, save the gatehouse, which I can attest is old as fuck. In 1920, the Archdiocese of Philadelphia bought it and erected this monstrous building, pick-related. The Archdiocese opened the building as St. Vincent's Orphanage and had the Sisters of Charity run it. The nuns lived in a wing of the building attached to the main hall. During the time of St. Vincent's Orphanage, apparently some of the children killed each other by smothering. A nun also hung herself in the bell tower. The bell tower had been off limits for a while, but that didn't stop us really. When I say Prendergast is monstrous, I mean it. There's two theaters, a bell tower, a library, more rooms than they could ever use. It's beautiful, but it's the type of place you'd expect to have hidden rooms. It's a weird comparison, but it actually reminds me kinda of the castle in Beauty and the Beast. We were never allowed to go into the convent wing, so naturally me and my friends would bring girls back there to kiss. It's definitely not a cool place to be in though. You can tell every room has been abandoned for years. I got a story for y'all. Might not be any of your ghost stories, demons, aliens, what have you, but still fascinating enough, and hoping that it will motivate people to share stories of their folks of unusual traits. I'm here to tell you folks about a fella from Sullivan County called Leonard Bordolos, but most just call him Lipless Lenny. From how the story goes, his mother was a widow to a former military lawyer named Adam Bordolos. He would often go off on long ass trips due to the nature of his firm. He handled the cases that were along the lines of Agent Orange doesn't cause problems. Depleted uranium isn't as strong as they say, etc., etc., even going so far as actually handling some of the objects in question to prove that they were safe. Although he was given golf claps for attempting to go the extra mile to prove his case, it did nothing but cause him health problems. So to make a long story short, Adam got his wife Mildred pregnant, some people think that's what one of the townships here is named after, but probably BS. After she gave birth, 
Leonard was absolutely covered in tumors and things that had striking resemblance to burn scars along with other odd deformities. Now, there's no telling what other deformities he had since people keep tagging more and more onto the urban legend, but three are certain. He had benign tumors that deformed his face and body, he had textureless and stretched skin like burn scars, and he had an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex and an atrophied temporal lobe, which is likely what prompted his parents to treat him so bad. Times got tough as time went on, and Lenny was treated poorly by his mother and father. As an infant, they'd put cigarettes out on him among other things, and later, they kept him alive and chained in the attic, only as a punching bag for the two. His sobs would keep the parents awake, and that would prompt various beatings. Some versions of the story say that he was stripped nude, and had things shoved in his rear as punishment sometimes. Now, they did feed him of course. They gave him rotten and spoiled stuff. Occasionally, he'd find rodents running around. He'd bite his lip, let the blood drip on the ground, and bait the rodents. Over time, it began to be his only source of meat. Until winter came along. The father, disgusted at the son, and tired of the mother, left the two with nothing. The son grew weaker as the mother grew angrier, beating him mercilessly. Her goal was to starve him apparently. In a fit of hunger, Lenny bit off his own lips to keep the hunger pains at bay. Soon after that, he bit off his tongue, then the inside of his cheeks, until his mouth looked like someone took a damn blender to it. Although the story isn't clear on how, he managed to escape the chains. He was about five years old by the time he was put in the chains, and was 33 when he got out of them. He knew nothing about the world other than people meant pain, and that he looked different. To hide, he managed to find or steal some long clothes, and a wide-brimmed hat. He spent his days watching families, and eating their pets if they ever got out of the house. Now, there's no official homicides, be them intentional or not, but people said that those that got too close to him would get bitten, and that the decay in his mouth was strong enough to prompt the victims into sepsis without immediate treatment. They all described him as a distressed looking man with his brow down until I was up close. He's definitely dangerous if you get close enough. Now, it may be an urban legend, but with this whole plague thing going on, sometimes I reckon if he's taking advantage of it and donning a mask of his own to walk among people. Either way, Lenny is seen around and about in all the remote counties of Pennsylvania just watching from a distance and hissing if people get close. Anyone else have some odd fellows or urban legends that lurk around their place? Also, sorry for the confusion in relaying the tale. When I said that Mildred was a widow to Adam Bordolos, the story indicates that he dies of cancer a little bit after his separation from her. Since they were divorced before he died, I suppose that wouldn't make her a widow. Okay guys, listen up. I live in Pittsburgh, Millvale to be exact. I have visited 13 Bens, in, I believe, Fox Chapel. I am truly frightened of it. I was driven out there about a year ago, with some high school buddies, looking for a spook. The road is off the main road, go past a housing plan, and you'll come to a gate. Past the gate you'll walk down the side of a mountain big enough for several cars or heavy machinery. Toward the bottom there will be a fork, go straight and, more to come. Go right and you'll reach some type of tower structure currently in use. Further past comes the type of pipeline and pumping equipment. It's very spooky, but nothing paranormal, as I could see. Until we got to the end of the pipe. We heard, what sounded like, a 1980s truck starting up and revving like hell then instantly dying. However, 
To my knowledge, we were in the middle of the woods far from any roads or houses. We all began to freak out and left, feeling very unsettled. Back to the fork I mentioned, two kids went straight, and immediately ran screaming for us to run. One of those kids was fat as fuck and wouldn't full on sprint just as a joke. They refused to talk about what they saw once we got back to the car. That's all I got. Definitely worth a visit. I live in Pennsburg about an hour north of Philly. And a lot of weird shit happens here since it's a total shithole, but the one that takes the cake is something that I actually saw first and told people about. And soon afterward when people went looking more people told me they saw it. I'll tell my personal experience with it then add some more. Be biking around at 3 in the morning because I have sleeping troubles and that's how I deal with it. Bike past my friend's house on this back road into a pharmacy parking lot. There is a black car taking up four spaces parked horizontally. All black to the manufacturer logo, no license plates, and the windows are tinted to the point where you can see the profile of people in the car but no features. The figures didn't move one inch, didn't make a single sound, just looking forward. Now since my town is known for drugs I thought this might be a few druggies having a bad trip or something worse into their car so I rushed over. Knocked on the car, no response. Asked are you all okay in there, no response. Eventually pulled the door and started trying to get in, even kicking the door and trying to pry it open with my bowie I had on me. Run back to mentioned friend's house asked him to get some tools to help break in this car. We both rush back and it's gone. My friend thought I was pulling some pranks on him. For days later he saw the same damn thing. Since that occurrence about a month ago two more of my friends have seen it. I haven't gone looking for it, but I guarantee if I tried finding it I would. Another weird thing is people have gone looking for it in that parking lot, and it only seems to appear when someone is alone. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Ever been to Greensburg, Pennsylvania? There's this park there, Twin Lakes. On the lake, near the very rim of it, to the north. There was this very small stretch of land known in the community as Kelly's Trail. Now, on the island there really wasn't any trail, it was an imaginary pathway that led from the mainland onto the island and cut through it. This trail gained its name after a young girl in the community named Kelly Woodson went missing on that island. As you can see, the island is not very big at all. So it's baffling to say that a girl is lost on it, or she was never found on it. In my younger years, I was a member of a paranormal detective agency. Pretty much just a group of me and my friends pretending to be like the guys from those Ghost Hunter TV shows. So, when we heard about her strange disappearance, we jumped at the possibility to investigate the matter. The water leading onto the land was only about waist deep. So we decided to simply walk onto the island and do our investigation. Not knowing any better, we only brought flashlights, notebooks and crayons for writing. Keep in mind it was about sunset when we first arrived. We decided to split up. Two of us would take the west end coast of the island, the other two would take the east, and we'd meet up at the north then go straight down the center in a pack. It was a fairly organized procedure for our age. Except for me, that is. Because we didn't quite agree on what to do with me. Because there were five people in the club, and their strategy only accounted for four. So, I was sent straight down the middle of the island prematurely. The trees weren't too tall near the southern end of the island, but up at the northern end, as you can see in the picture. It got pretty thick, so, nothing too special happened around the southern end. Keep in mind that this island is bigger than it looks. I couldn't see or hear the others, so I was isolated with my fear. It was very dark around this time. About an hour after we arrived. This is where things begin to get weird, around the middle of the island, right before the trees started to get larger. I came upon a tree with an old zipper jacket nailed onto it. Well, not nailed, it looked like a wooden stake was driven through it pinning it to the tree. This didn't creep me out so much, 
it was more the fact that it looks ancient as fuck. It was covered in mold and plant debris, almost as if it had been there for a very long time. When the Kelly case had happened mere months ago, I decided not to contaminate the evidence like the people from TV did. And I moved on along my route to the end of the island. When I was pondering the jacket, I came upon a realization that excited me and terrified me at the same time. If the jacket wasn't Kelly's, then that means someone else must have visited the island before. Meaning that there might actually be something on the island that's worth investigating. At this point, I didn't have any evidence for specifics. Anyway, I kept on walking until I saw something strange, the bushes ahead of me were rustling heavily, and the air on that night was very still. So it couldn't have been the wind. I began to become paranoid and I felt a panic attack coming on, regardless I braved through it and ran through the bushes to see what was on the other side. Nothing, I saw nothing at all. The minute I made contact with them the rustling seemed to stop. But when one oddity ceased another began, I felt the insistent sensation of being watched, as if I weren't alone. That terrified me, the terror only intensified by the realization that it was night, and all scary things happen at night. About five minutes had passed since I started walking, and I was wondering just how big the island was, or if I was suffering from some sort of visual distortion and the island was actually much larger than it seemed, it wasn't. Either that or I was moving very slow, I honestly had no explanations. It was just for some reason. Just more and more trees and bushes got in my way, it was never ending. The farther I went the feeling of being watched intensified, almost to where I couldn't help looking behind my shoulders every five seconds. This is where things begin to get even more intense. I looked behind my shoulder like I was doing constantly, and I noticed a shadow moving silently through the undergrowth. Not making any noise whatsoever. I tried to flash my flashlight on it and I saw nothing. Then the branches over my head began to shake and I lifted my flashlight up to that. Disturbances that almost had no source were coming from all around me, and I finally couldn't take the fear. I screamed and took off running towards the north end of the island to reach safety with my friends. I heard nothing coming after me but I wasn't convinced. It seemed much longer than it actually took but eventually I came out of the tree line and onto the coastline where I was supposed to meet my friends. They weren't there. I began calling out their names, believing it was some joke. But they never answered, I began to cry out loud calling their names. Still, no answer. I waited for a while, maybe about 15 minutes. It seemed impossible for them to be taking so long. I eventually got tired of waiting and slowly moved back to where I reached the island, to try to go home. To try to feel safe again, but before I got very far. I heard a rustling coming from the tree line which I had just recently left. I looked and saw a short, dark figure sliding smoothly down one of the trees, not grabbing onto any branches, not making any noise besides the occasional rustle of leaves almost as if wind was being blown over them. I looked on in horror as it reached the dirt below, and curled its body underneath it inhumanly, sliding up to its feet slowly but steadily, like a perfect acrobat, inhuman flexibility. I tried to scream but seeing as a panic attack came on suddenly, I struggled to get any air out of my lungs. It just sort of oddly bent one knee forward, and flexed one leg out to impossible angles, and gently lowered the leg onto the floor again to move. It was slowly coming towards me, and I was frozen in place by terror. Eventually, lack of oxygen took me, due to my panic attack, and I drifted off into unconsciousness. Maybe. When I came to, I was lying on the dirt in the middle of the thicket I was going on in my path. I sat up, not remembering much at the time. Only when I fully stood up and got a bearing of my surroundings did I finally remember what I had seen. My breath caught in my throat, and I feared I was beginning to have another panic attack, but the tightness in my chest never came. Instead, I began to run, run as fast as my legs could take me. Back to the place my friends were supposed to meet me. This time, 
They were there, and boy did they look pissed off at me. They started shooting questions at me, asking me where the fuck I was, why the fuck I didn't answer when they were calling out my name. I just blinked oddly and asked what time it was. I realized it had been over two hours, which meant I had to have been passed out for quite a long fucking time, or what I saw never really happened. That just never explained why I passed out, as we were all sitting in the darkness, I began to get the strange sensation of being watched again, and I asked my friends if we could just call it a night. They asked me if I saw anything that took up my time. I said no, and we just went home calling the investigation a failure. I still think it was the right thing not to tell them shit, because they would have insisted we stay and do more investigating, but I felt sick to my stomach and scared out of my mind. I wasn't in any mood to look for what I had seen. I always had the intention to grow the balls to head back there, but the next day I didn't. The day after that I didn't, the years passed and gradually it just faded from my memory. Until I had just recently gotten together with those friends again, and talked about how stupid we were as kids, we talked about it then. I still didn't tell them. I live in Pittsburgh, in a wooded suburban area called Fox Chapel. B10. Sleeping with my siblings in a big bed. Awake. Just staring at the ceiling and watching how the darkness in the room changes as I focus on a darker area in the room versus a lighter area. All of a sudden an extremely bright light white illuminates the attached room. It's like an office with a window that faces the backyard. It really was like a light you would see when a car points at your house, but there weren't any roads where the light came from. Just my backyard and about two acres of woods. All of a sudden I am 100% frozen, can't move anything, can't scream. Very similar feeling to sleep paralysis. Three beings, tall, slender with a slight gray appearance that was difficult to discern because my head was laying down and I had to point my eyes downward to see them walking past the foot of my bed and over to where I was sleeping. I sense them standing next to me, all of a sudden I feel my back leave the bed and I swear I am levitating two to three feet above the bed. I am so fucking scared at this point, I have literally never been so scared in my entire life. And this is why I remember this evening so well. Next thing I know it is morning, my family has already woken up and are downstairs. I'm the only person that had this experience. Also in that house two separate times near that same age I would be either sitting or laying with my back up to something and would blink very normally but when I opened my eyes, many hours had passed. Always happened at night and after blinking it would be daytime. Very strange shit. My older sister had a similar thing happen to her with the blinking and hours passing by. Okay. X, I have a long set of stories to share. This isn't an attempt at some creepypasta. Everything here is completely real and currently terrifying me and the people involved. The story doesn't actually begin with me. It begins with my friend who has lived in central Pennsylvania his whole life. I have his permission to tell this story to the best of my ability. He will see this thread and I ask him to correct any mistakes I make while telling this story. We'll call him Pete. Quite a few years ago, when Pete was about 10, he was staying home with his younger sister of about 3. His parents had gone out to eat with his two younger brothers for dinner and left the two of them alone, because one of them was sick or something, I dunno. It was dark and a bad storm had started up, which eventually caused the electricity to go out. So Pete grabs his sister and puts her on the couch and walks downstairs to the basement room to get flashlights or candles or something. This is typical horror movie shit so far but please stay with me, Things get weird and stay weird for a long time. So he gets down there and grabs the shit he needs, and suddenly stops as he hears voices coming from upstairs. He listens to what sounds like a woman's voice have a conversation with his little sister for a few minutes, until it just stops. 
He claims that he couldn't hear what they were saying but it seemed like a friendly conversation. Repeating this. There isn't supposed to be anyone in the house, so he's terrified out of his mind, waits for a few minutes more, then runs upstairs to find no one there with his sister. He calls his parents and then 911 immediately. He checks his house as they're coming home, going upstairs and finding a bathroom window open when it wasn't open before. I've asked him if it was possible for someone to get into the window, and he assures me that it's not. And on top of that, the window is an old type, with no locks, it's the second floor after all, and it can't be blown open by the wind because it opens up not to the side. So gravity has to be fought to actually open this window. Terrified again, he goes downstairs and locks him and his sister in his bedroom, waiting for help to arrive. His parents and the cops show up at about the same time, check the house to find nothing. His parents then laugh it off and call him paranoid, apologize to the cops for kids being kids, and everyone acts like it was just a kid being paranoid. Pete assures me that this isn't the case. Fast forward a few years and we know each other now. We're talking and we get on the subject of paranormal shit. I share a handful of stories from my life and he tells me this one. Obviously I'm creeped out by it but then he goes on to say that after that, People would find windows open in his house at random times, usually once every three or four months, with no explanation for how they opened. This is enough to set someone as paranoid as I am about shit off. I would have moved out of that house on the spot, but Pete says that he tried to ignore it and act like nothing weird was happening, and apparently his family did the same. This conversation we had sparked a new awareness in him, and the months that followed were even more bizarre. Not long ago, we were having a conversation online when he suddenly said that there was tapping coming from the window, the same motherfucking window that he found open on that night, upstairs. His cat and dogs went wild, hissing and arching their backs and barking and what have you, all looking at the window. He's terrified as he's describing this event to me. He claims that it's not a random tap, but rather it seems like it was timed, like a human knocks on a door with a certain interval. He went to his room with his pets, locked his door again, put a chair under the handle, and sat in fear, falling asleep much later. About a week later, Pete notices that one of the garden gnomes he has in his front yard has moved. Originally facing the road, it now looks upon his house. This is unnerving and can be easily explained but it's possible that it's relevant so I decided to mention it. A few weeks after the gnome thing, Pete is doing Pete shit, and suddenly tapping comes from his living room window, the same tapping as before. The animals go crazy again, hissing and staring the window down. Pete describes it as two taps in rapid succession with a two-second pause in between, for about half an hour. He messages me with the story immediately after the tapping stops. The next bit always terrifies me. Understand that this isn't that night, it's early the next morning, at like 4 am. We're still talking online, when suddenly he just stops and says, Harry, the doorbell just rang. I seriously thought he was fucking with me at first but after a bit I became convinced that that wasn't the case. I asked him why someone would be at the door at 4 am, and he sat confused and terrified. It rang one time, one time. Whoever was there apparently wasn't all that determined to get help or whatever, because it rang one goddamn time, I'm telling you. One doorbell rings at 4 am. I asked him where his family was, if they heard it or if they were out. He said they were all asleep upstairs, where you can't hear the doorbell. At this point I am begging him to move out of his house, but he tells me that his parents won't believe the doorbell or tapping stories. Pete then enters a phase that he only describes by saying, if anything weird happened, I didn't notice, because I was in denial. He started working out and focusing on his future career. We talked but not quite as much as before. Then last night happened. Last night wasn't weird, not for either of us. We talked a bit, late into the early morning hours, until I finally got too tired and went to bed. 
Then I woke up this morning to a very terrified Pete. I'm trying to tell myself that this can be explained away. I'm trying to tell myself that the last few hours didn't happen. This is a real story, guys. I'm not even a good writer. This shit is real. Pete messaged me as soon as I logged in today. He said that early this morning, after I went to bed, his animals started having a fit again. Not at any tapping or other noises he could hear, but they just started going off, like you would expect them to do before a hurricane or earthquake or something. Reminding him of the weird history he has with the house, and he was home alone. Pete isn't the bravest of souls and you wouldn't be either if you had dealt with this shit. He locked his bedroom door and put a chair under the handle to prevent the handle from being moved. About an hour later, he finally fell asleep. When he woke up, he looked at his door, and God be with me, the door was unlocked and his chair was moved. He insisted that he didn't wake up during the night. Pete has no history of sleepwalking. Even if Pete did have a history of sleepwalking, he would have had to taken two fingers, twisted the lock to unlock the door, all after moving the chair, during which he was apparently unconscious. Occam's razor doesn't know what to say here, guys. Then today happened. I remember Pete telling me about what happened with the locked door and then I remember a few hours more. I went to McDonald's and came back home and ate my double QPC. I played Xbox a bit. Then I think I went to bed. Apparently I remember incorrectly. I woke up a few hours ago and honestly thought I had slept for 7 plus hours. But I'm told that's not what happened. This next part is extremely confusing, and given that we're only a few hours removed from it, it's not very clear. I'm going to do the best I can. Pete says that I came back online and I was worried, I was claiming that I had received a phone call from a blocked number. Pete has caps of the following conversation, and many other people have claimed to have interacted with me throughout the evening. I told Pete that the number that called me was from an area code, 717, which Pete responded to in fear because Pete is an internet friend who refuses to give his phone number and location out because he's a paranoid fuck. I had no way of knowing what Pete's area code is. I have no idea how, I, apparently came up with 717. I don't even know if it's possible for a phone number to come up as a 1 to 717 number. I don't know much. A man was on the line, and all I told Pete was that he said, leave him, and hung up. That's it. I don't live anywhere near Pete, I don't know anyone in Pete's general area personally, and they don't know me. The evening goes on and a while later. We're talking to some mutual friends when I apparently say I have to take a phone call and disappear. My roommate confirms that I left the house in a hurry, not saying where I was going. I then disappeared for a period of about two hours, and no one knows where I was, least of all me. My roommate apparently showed my empty room to mutual friends, including Pete, who all confirmed that my bed was empty and that I had left my wallet in my room. My license was in there. At first I thought all of this was just an elaborate trolling attempt by my roommate, my girlfriend, who has the details to my accounts that apparently showed up on my daily sites, and Pete. But then my roommate told me that I should look at my truck, and when I did, my heart dropped. It wasn't in the same spot as before. Pete was terrified out of his mind. Fuck. I'm terrified out of my mind. I don't understand what happened at all. My roommates claimed that I returned earlier and just mumbled, I'm tired, and went straight to bed without a conversation. I don't remember any of this, and it can't be just a case of me being elaborately fucked with. How'd my truck get moved when my keys were in my pocket? How'd Pete get a screen cap of a conversation with me that I don't remember? Why do I have a post on a forum that I frequent that I never remember making? And to top this all off, when I finally woke up from my 7-hour nap, and was starting to hear about all the shit I supposedly did this evening, my lights flicker and dim and my electricity goes out for 10 minutes. I'm terrified out of my mind and I can't imagine that Pete is much better. He apparently is sleeping with knives. X, I doubt telling this story is going to help anything. 
Pete thinks that bad things seem to happen when him and I talk about sharing this whole story with someone. Now it's been shared. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry that my story ends without answers, but that's it. That's where we are now. And I'm scared to death. This happened when I was eight years old. I know that is young, and memories from then are tricky. I don't doubt this. I was spending a week in the summer at my grandparents' house near Brownsville, Pennsylvania. At home I shared a bedroom, bunk beds actually, with my brother. At my grandparents' house I had the spare bedroom to myself. I had trouble sleeping the entire time I was there. On the second night sleep just wasn't happening and I got up a few hours after everyone else in the house was asleep. It was an unfamiliar house. All the sounds were different. The clock in the dining room was so loud and, this doesn't make a lot of sense, but, final sounding. At some point I decided to go out in the backyard. It was a large, fenced-in yard with a long porch-type swing on a frame out in the middle of the yard under a big sycamore. I sat on it for a while and was almost drifting off when I heard dogs barking. One started yapping far away, and then dogs from nearer yards joined in until the next-door neighbor's dog started going crazy. I sat there, not swinging, not moving, too afraid to move. Something came over the fence. I don't really know how to describe the way it came over. It sort of poured itself over the top, and fell to the yard. If you've ever played with silly putty and let gravity stretch it out over your finger, it was sort of like that, but quicker. Then it stood up. I remember thinking it looked like a person who was stretched out somehow. Very tall, very skinny. I didn't move or say a word. Somehow I got the impression it was female. I couldn't tell you how or why I thought this, but I knew. I also knew she was terrified, and seemed to be running from something. She stood there, almost crouching, and looked around the yard. Then she saw me. She jerked back, and I thought she was going to go back over the fence. She didn't. She walked over to where I sat, covering the distance way faster than should have been possible, and stopped a couple of feet in front of me. She was so tall. I could see now she wasn't wearing anything like clothing, was completely bald, and that her skin was a very light gray color. There was no genitalia or sex characteristics I could see. Her eyes were very large. Since then I have seen pictures of what people call gray aliens. This is the closest thing I have found to what she looked like, but the pictures are not right. Not at all. She was very graceful and maternal. She seemed so sad. I realized, as she stood in front of me, looking at me with her head cocked slightly to the side, that I was crying. I was not scared, I felt some sense of great loss coming off her in waves. It felt desperate, and sad, and horrible, like there was something that should have been good, really good, being lost. Some missed opportunity that should not have been missed, and may not come again. She reached a hand out to me and gently brushed my cheek with her long fingers, then touched my head. She then ran off to the other side of the yard and went over the fence. A few seconds later I heard the dogs again. I sat there sobbing for a long time. Eventually I went back in the house and went to bed. I never mentioned it to my grandparents, or anyone else, until now. There is the ghost town Silent Hill. The movie at least, took a lot of inspiration from. Creepy in the sense that at any moment, you might fall straight through the earth into a fiery death in brimstone and smoldering coal. Centralia is a borough and a near ghost town in Columbia County, Pennsylvania, United States. Its population has dwindled from over 1,000 residents in 1981 to 10 in 2010, as a result of a mine fire burning beneath the borough since 1962. Centralia is one of the least populated municipalities in Pennsylvania. All properties in the borough were claimed under eminent domain by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in 1992, and all buildings therein were condemned, and Centralia's zip code was revoked by the Postal Service in 2002. A few residents continue to reside there in spite of the failure of a lawsuit to reverse the eminent domain claim. 
Runkle Hall. I lived in homes and you could. I lived there first two years. Graduated in May. Use your ID to get into any North dorm. It's a third floor study lounge. Was supplemental sophomore year. Don't know what it is now. I can't remember which of the two on the floor it was. We just gauged it by the empty one haha. Well my roommates and I. North has two bedroom suites. So it was my brother. Roommate. A fellow freshman sweetmate, and his roommate who was a senior and a stereotypical world of Warcraft playing, cat-loving redditor neckbeard. One night, we all went over to the room and went in and sat down with the lights off, but the study lounges had a pair of dimmed lights that never turned off. The freshman sweetmate took out his iPhone and just started recording and swinging around the room etc. for like a minute or so. The neckbeard started yelling. I'm an atheist, come and get me. After like five minutes we thought we heard something, saw a shadow move and booked it out of there, though most likely it was just our imaginations. So when we get back to our room, the guy recording the footage decides to play it. For some reason, the footage is in black and white and no sound, he had just hit record so it should be a normal, has color and sound, recording. Also after about 10 seconds of the minute-long recording, the recording stops and the phone gets shut off. Thinking it was a one-off kind of thing, he turns it on and plays it again. Same thing. Again. Same thing. After that, he deleted the video. And my brother who saw all this still swears up and down that the paranormal doesn't exist. Another time, sweet mates, and eventually best friend, girlfriend and I were waiting for him to get done with a test so we could go drinking, party. We got the bright idea to go see the ghost that supposedly haunts the library. We looked all around the stacks and didn't see shit. I looked up later that only girls have seen the ghost, so keep that in mind. Does anybody from Altoona know about the horseshoe curve? It's an only single lane tunnel that runs under some railroad tracks right next to a huge dam. On summer nights, the dam has a thick haze over it. The tunnel has a stop light on both sides. Kids always run that dam light and end up self-ending themselves in a head-on, real nasty shit. Well me and my buddies made a denice run a week ago, decided to go ghost hunting up a horseshoe, not expecting anything around 1 o'clock on a summer night. Cruising in my buddy's Mustang, we head up past the dam, with its fog rolling over the road. We could barely see the red light ahead, and were coming up fast. Everybody telling Bub to run it, and others not to. Finally he said fuck it at gassed it right through, his 4.6 grabbing a buck 20 right as we enter the tunnel. Not a word was said. I closed my eyes waiting to be thrown through the windshield. It seemed like everyone held their breath, till we were out. We started heading up the hill. Through a maze of curves. It seemed like we drove forever. Before we got back home. Shadows seemed to move, everybody creeped each other out more than they should have. There's a bunch of stupid shit like ghost haunting the old railroad tracks that run through towns, how El Capone ran guns through El Mora and hid them in the old high school. Whispers in the woods, dumb stuff. A little town not far from Harrisburg called Mount Holly Springs. I'm not far from a state park that is basically one massive block of thick forest that literally goes on for miles. Friends of mine have told me stories about some kind of human-like creatures in the woods around our area, apparently sometimes they come up to people's houses. One time I saw something human-shaped but definitely not human, but it was too far away to see clearly. The only thing I can say is that its face was kind of elongated and it scared the holy fuck out of me. Looked kind of like how I would picture a Native American skinwalker. Sup, X. So, some strange shit's been happening around my house lately. I live in rural Pennsylvania, about an hour west of Centralia. I've always been big into the paranormal and shit, but I never really saw anything. So the main issue I have is that I'm kind of socially inept. After all, 
When most of your conversation is historical references and ghost stories, not many people want to talk to you. So I've found myself taking to the woods out behind my parents' house. After all, it's spring. Might as well go outside, right? Anyways, I've taken to hiking on my parents' property. It's not that far a drive, and there's a great view if you can reach the top of the hill. The only real danger out there are snakes, bears, and a few different kinds of spiders. Due to these dangers, I carry a kukri with me, along with a pistol. For those that don't know what a kukri is, it's a big fuck-off knife. I don't expect to fight bears with the thing, but it's nice to have for the bushes. I also have a small backpack filled with cliff bars, a camelback bladder, about 12 feet of rope, and a first aid kit. Well, the other day I came across something interesting. The usual path I follow is an old ATV trail. Most of it is overgrown, hence the big fuck-off knife I mentioned. Usually I'm careful when I walk, but this time out went full dumb ass and twisted my ankle. Now, I wear an old pair of army boots that hug the ankle, so it wasn't a bad twist, but is still hurt like a bitch. As I got up to the top of the hill, the sun began to fall behind the horizon. Okay, not a big deal. I can just walk back after a small break. I sat down on an old stump and pulled out one of the bars. As I nibbled at the cliff bar, I examined the area around me. I'd never been up here so late, so I was curious as to what I would see. Of course, I saw nothing for a long while. I crumpled up the wrapper and stuffed it back in my pack. No sense in waiting until it was dark, I thought. Might as well go home and get the ankle looked at. That's when I saw movement in the bushes. Thinking it was either a deer or a bear, I drew my pistol. A deer would run, and I hoped my gun was enough to at least stall a bear. I pointed it at the bushes, staring down the sights. That's when a woman walked out of the bushes, immediately screaming shit and dropping to the side. I lowered the gun and apologized. The woman was about 4 foot 10, with black hair and pale skin. She was in average hiking clothes as well, so I didn't think anything was out of place. I asked her what the hell she was doing sneaking through the bushes, and she told me she'd gotten lost. I apologized again for almost shooting her, and we talked a while longer. After a few minutes I noticed she had oddities. She spoke with an accent I couldn't quite place. It sounded European, but at the same time sounded off. She also sat eerily still, as if even the gusts of wind weren't moving anything. It was then I noticed her eyes. One was a dark blue, the other was a brown. I'm talking a deep, earthen brown. I pointed that out and she immediately took offense. I didn't see why, after all, that's pretty damn cool to have that going on. I then asked where she came from. About an hour east of here. I chuckled to myself, so you come from Silent Hill? What? Centralia. It's, there's a game series that took inspiration from there. Oh. Cool. We sat in silence for a long while. It was starting to get dark, and I didn't have camping supplies. From the looks of her pack, she hadn't brought any either. I asked if she parked close by. She responded with a confident no. So, being the chivalrous gentleman I am, I asked if she wanted a lift to her car. Once again, she said no. Understandably, you don't accept rides from strangers that carry guns and cookeries around. It then hit me that I didn't even know her name. So, I introduced myself. Hey, I'm Jake. Emily. Well, at least I had a name. I stood up and said my goodbyes to Emily and explained I was going to head back. Once again I offered her a ride, to which she declined. I started limping away on my bad ankle, only to have her tell me to stop. I do as asked, and slowly turned. She asked me what I did to injure it, and I explained that I twisted it coming up the hill. She then asked me to sit down and undo my boot. This is the part where things got odd. Now I had planned on just roughing out the ankle until I got back home. I didn't think it required any first aid at all. 
However, Emily disagreed. She explained that there was a nearby stream, and that it could help fold the pain. After she helped me up, we walked into the bushes. I looked around, taking notice of different things. This area of the forest had something most of it didn't. It had color. There were purple and pink flowers in the bushes, the bark was a very healthy looking brown. It was also just a tad brighter in the area. There was a light coming from somewhere, but I couldn't make out where. We eventually came to the stream, and she began working on my ankle. I began pulling out the first aid, but she insisted that it wasn't needed. Odd. I hadn't pegged her as an all-natural type. She carefully used the stream's water to bathe my twisted ankle. It hurt for a moment as she moved it around, but it began to start feeling better. Much better. Now I know this has fuck all to do with my house, but just hang on. After the ankle thing, it gets a little blurry. Like when you're smoking some dank shit and can't really get thoughts straight. After the stream thing, I remember being in my car. It was the next morning, my seat was reclined, and my back ached like a motherfucker. I assumed I must have gone back down and slept in the car. I rotated my ankle to find that, yeah, it still hurts. I dug in my pack for a bar and started up the car. I pushed the odd shit off as some sort of odd dream. After all, I was still injured. I drove home shortly after. The night before was still a little hazy. As I pulled into my driveway, I noticed something odd. There were small stones, about the size of my hand, placed in a circle in my front yard. I walked over and picked one up. It, it was black as tar, with an odd symbol carved into it. I pocketed the stone and headed inside. The shower was calling my name. A few days passed before anything happened. I'd removed the stones from the yard and placed them in a box. The box then went into my garage for me to not give a fuck about. After about a week, I started having odd dreams. The first dream was average. It was Emily and I at the stream. We chatted while she fixed my ankle. The next night, I had another dream. This one was, far more odd. Emily was gone, and I was lying on my back in the stream. I stared up at the stars, and the light was getting brighter around me. The next day I found the stones rearranged into the circle. I saw it when I went out for the morning paper. I gathered them up again, out them back in the box, and taped it shut. I was not going to ask how they got out there. Anyways a few weeks passed before anything happened again. It was late at night, and I was watching TV. As I was flicking through the channels, I heard my front door open. I called out to see who it was. I slowly reached for my gun when I got no response back. A few moments passed before I stood up and walked over to the door. It was wide open. I glanced outside. Nothing. I turned and looked down the hallway. Nothing. That's when I heard what sounded like a clopping. If you've ever heard a deer walking around, this is what it sounded like. I followed the sound throughout my house, but I never saw a deer. A few days later, I heard someone running around my garage. When I went in there, I saw the box the stones had been in was gone. The garage door was closed. A few days after that, I began hearing giggling. It would be at random times, and sounded like a little girl's laugh. When I would investigate, I would find nothing. The squonk, lacrimae corpus dissolvens, is a mythical creature reputed to live in the hemlock forest of northern Pennsylvania. Legends of squonks probably originated in the late 19th century, at the height of Pennsylvania's importance in the timber industry. The earliest known written account of squonks comes from a book by William T. Cox called Fearsome Creatures of the Lumberwoods, with a few desert and mountain beasts. The legend holds that the creature's skin is ill-fitting, being covered with warts and that, because it is ashamed of its appearance, it hides from plain sight, and spends most of its time weeping. Hunters who have tried catching squonks have found out the creature is capable of dissolving completely into a pool of tears and bubbles when cornered. A man named J.P. Wentling is supposed to have coaxed the creature into a bag, 
of which when he carried it home it suddenly lightened. Upon further inspection he found that all that remained was the liquid remains of the sad animal. All right, so something strange happened today. Seeing as it was one of the nicest days we've had in Pennsylvania in a while, I decided to go for a hike. Near the local high school there's an old, overgrown cross-country trail. I tend to take that trail into the forest. I usually leave electronics, besides my trusty flashlight, behind. I set out after four, so I didn't run into anyone from the school. I jogged through a few backyards, across the school's track, and into the forest. The trail itself is out of shape and shitty, with fallen trees blocking the path in many locations. So for a good half mile you have to follow this old dirt path, and hop over the fallen trees. After that, there's a seven foot wide stream. A good running jump will get you over it easily. This stream is where things got strange. I went to hop over the stream, but ended up stumbling and falling in. After a few moments of cussing the stream, I noticed footprints in the muck. Whoever left them was walking around barefoot, or wearing those shitty, we help your foot. Vibrams. The footprint was tiny, compared to mine. The footprints appeared to follow parallel to the trail I was taking, so I shrugged it off. Probably a shoe less homeless person wandering the woods. So I stood up, brushed myself off, and continued down the trail. As I went down the pathway, I noticed the footprints were getting shallow. As if the person was losing weight, or pulling themselves up on something. I began paying more attention to these footprints, rather than the trail I was supposed to be following. They got lighter and lighter, until they eventually stopped. Now, dirt and mud can fuck with footprints very easily. So I turned around and looked at the footsteps my boots had left. They were lighter once I got away from the mud, but consistent. They remained relatively the same on solid ground, not like this mystery person. I focused my attention on the path once more, although my thoughts kept going back to the footprints. Maybe someone needed help. Hell, maybe someone needed a pair of shoes. I kept walking, thinking about the person who left the prints. So I kept walking along the path, my thoughts a mess. Who left the prints? Were they hurt? Did they have a place to stay? Was I following some nature-loving hippie? I wasn't sure. However, one thing became very clear. I was horribly lost. I had ventured from the trail, off into the forest. The forest was extremely dense in these parts, because Pennsylvania. I pulled out my compass and map, trying to find where I was. I took a few paces, but the compass wasn't really working. It wasn't spinning around, but it had trouble finding north. Every once in a while it would slowly turn to point in a different direction. So after a few moments I was hopelessly lost again. I leaned against a nearby oak tree and thought for a moment. I was still leaving footsteps when I walked. So, if I retraced them, I'd find my way back to the trail. I followed my footprints for a solid few minutes, I realized I was back where I'd started. I'd walked in a circle, somehow. So, I let out a sigh and tried again. Another circle. Somehow my footprints were leading me in a circle. Now, I'm not dumb enough to follow the first fuck up. I was doing my best to follow the original set. It was in this moment I noticed that the foliage around me was littered with mushrooms. So I kept walking, the compass proving more and more useless. I put it in the map away, looking around. If I could find a hill, a cliff, anything, I'd stand a chance. I began exploring, using a pocket knife to cut an X in the trees as I made my way into the forest. Usually, I don't get lost in the wilderness, so I started to panic a bit. I looked through the wilderness, trying to find anything I recognized. As I walked, I noticed that my footprints had appeared beside me. I had turned and walked backwards at some point. I was about to give up when I heard something in the distance. I heard a high-pitched voice, singing softly. I listened for a moment. It wasn't a language I recognized, but it sounded soothing. The melody restored hope in me. So, I stood and walked towards the singing. 
I followed the singing for a while, always just out of eyesight of who was singing. As I followed, I noticed that the bare footprints had returned. However, the stride was different. It looked like someone skipping or dancing through the forest. However, my mind stayed focused on the singing. So I followed it, letting the soothing voice guide my way. After what felt like a half hour, the singing led me back to the pathway I knew. As I stepped onto the pathway, I saw who had been singing. She was a short woman, with pale skin and green eyes. Her hair was a fiery orange, with a crown of flowers adorning the top of her head. She had a white dress, with mud staining the bottom of it. She smiled at me, pointing to the path. I tried to speak with her, but she didn't seem to understand a word I said. She just kept pointing to the path. After trying and failing to get a word out of her, I simply did as she asked and followed the path out of the forest. So, X, there's my story. It's not much, not scary, but weirded me the fuck out. We have a ton of pagans and druids in the area, but this seemed different. Sorry I don't have a real ending to this story, but that's all that happened. I just went home, got a drink, and started typing this up. Mud mermaids are mermaid-like creatures commonly believed to have lived in the muddy banks of the Ohio River during the early 19th and 20th centuries. They were recounted in an 1839 Pennsylvania newspaper as being about 4 feet high and covered with a light coat of chestnut-colored hair. They're also described as having a yellowish skin color and webbed feet at the end of their four limbs. Though different sightings report the creature having slightly different attributes they are always described as having vaguely humanoid and amphibious features. They are said to run and swim at high speeds and let out loud screeches and yelps when pursued. Their diet is presumed to mainly consist of frogs and fish. In the past, they did not show any interest in attacking humans and have been reported as being easily startled and reclusive creatures. Their sharp teeth and claws may seem threatening but seem to primarily be used for catching fish and other small river animals. The legendary ape-like creature known as the Sasquatch has been sighted across the forests of North America. Mostly sighted along the Pacific Northwest, sightings occur across the continent, including some particularly bizarre cases in Pennsylvania that involve a white-furred Bigfoot-like creature usually sighted with UFOs. The Pennsylvanian white Bigfoot was first sighted in Blakesley, Pennsylvania in 1970. According to eyewitness Annette B., the creature she saw in 1970, which stood between 6 and 7 feet tall, with a broad chest, a long neck and a coat of dirtied white fur. Annette went on to describe its face. Its eyes were dark and spaced far apart. Its, white, hair covered the lower half of its face. There was pinkish skin around the eyes and forehead. It looked like its hair was a little longer on its head and hanging over its forehead like bangs. On September 27, 1973, two girls were standing outside in Beaver County, Pennsylvania at 9.30 p.m. when an eight-foot-tall being covered with white fur and with red glowing eyes ran into the woods nearby. The humanoid was carrying a large glowing orb in its hands. The girls ran off hysterically into their house. The father of one of the girls then went into the woods in search of the creature and stayed there for over an hour. That same year, a glowing orb lands near of Uniontown, Pennsylvania, and two Bigfoot creatures are observed in the pasture at the same time. A woman fires her shotgun at a Bigfoot creature only a few feet away and it disappears out of sight. At about the same time a luminous object hovered over the nearby woods. The ball-tailed cat, sometimes erroneously called Ding Ball, Felis candiglobosa, sometimes erroneously Felis cataglobosa, is a fearsome critter from North American legend. It is said to once have lined in a much more wilder circulation than at present day, but now the ball-tailed cat is confined in Harney County, Oregon, and Sullivan County, Pennsylvania. The ball-tailed cat's appearance is that of a fair-sized cat of about the dimensions of the wildcat, but with a far more aggressive disposition. Its chief physical characteristic is a hard, heavy, bony ball on the end of its tail, with the tail tip on the top of the ball. The feet are clawed, making it an excellent climber and it has the habit of lying out on a tree limb. When an unsuspecting lumberjack passes beneath, 
The cat drops on its victim and pounds the lumberjack to death with the ball. Male ball-tailed cats use their tails to drum on a hollow log and attract females. The ball-tailed cat has similar traits to the sliver cat and the dingmal, with the latter two thought to be variations of the tail, and that all three cats are distantly related, though, to be fair, the ball-tailed cat is a less but still highly developed variant of the same phylum as the sliver cat. Alright slash x slash. First time posting here but this thread is relevant to my interests. I'll start from about age 14 up until most recently age 28. I'm currently 30. Most of these events took place on my property, was left to me, in the Pocono Mountains. 13 acres, wooded, very old lived on land as one old local used to say. I forget how to use trips, but I'll just be Pocono guy if you want to follow. First event I can really recall was my father and I walking in the woods late at night. I was 14 at the time, not afraid of the dark, and we always used to walk the property without flashlights. We start walking down towards the valley of our land, constant downhill then sudden 75 feet drop into a valley with a creek running through. As you walk down this, it gets to be a really engulfing darkness from the tree canopy. As we're walking I heard rustling about 100 yards higher up the hill. My father stops and looks at me. I nod. Immediately after that there's another rustle, about 100 yards to my right, farther down the hill, almost in the valley. Now we just look at each other. One more rustle. Directly behind us. They all stop at the same time. Two seconds after the rustling stops we both hear a bloop sound, think water dripping in the sink, that completely surrounds us, can't tell where the noise originated. All three rustling continues away from us. We stopped for a moment, looked at each other, and walked back to the house. I will remember that sound and moment till the day I die. Next event I recall is from that same summer, probably three weeks later. Forgot all about the bloop. I was up late at night, probably around midnight to 1 AM. I shut down the Dreamcast, I hear the laughs from here, and get into bed. As I lay there I have my windows open. It was a nice night, and there was no real need to use the air conditioner at night up here over 15 years ago. I'm still laying there and I start to hear footsteps coming towards my window, walking through the dense grass that lines the house. The footsteps stop right at my window. I am shitting myself. Quiet for a moment, felt like eternity, and suddenly there's a series of clicks and beeps from right outside my window. Cue internal screaming. The sounds lasted no more than a few seconds but it was terrifying. I said nothing, didn't move, no breathing. After the sounds ceased, the footsteps receded. Turned the Dreamcast back on, shut the window. This never happened. I put one of those auto tape recorders on my window every night for the next two weeks, never heard anything again. Alright so this one is a bit weird. Call me crazy but I give no fucks. I've seen this happen with my own eyes along with my father and his friend. So at the beginning of summer when I was about 16 my father stated he keeps seeing these flat black helicopters always traveling to and from the same direction, I'll get to what lies in that direction later. I say yeah sure dad blah 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 let me know when you see them. Forget about it, but about a week later I hear rotor thump. He comes running in from outside yelling for me, that it's here. I grab my good binox and go outside. Well son of a bitch. Look at this flat black helo and use my binox to look for tail markings. I think they're there, but they're in black too. Can't make out a damn thing. Notice they seem to have fuel pods, or possibly missile pods. Couldn't tell. But they were fucking straight up black helos. The funny thing is these helos were heading towards a place that more than several people have told me there's a secret government bunker built into this mountain. On top of this mountain is a ski resort and the rest of the land is under control of a water authority over 100 miles away. These people told me about riding the trails and getting rolled up on by army guys with guns, in Humvees and being told to GTFO. I always lent credence to this because there's a high value army depot not far from the site that takes care of a lot of the east coast government comms. Anyway. So one day in the summer my father, his friend, and myself are outside. We start to hear the thumps of rotors, but close. Real close. 
this black helo flies over us about 200 feet off the deck towards the woods behind our house. Turns left to follow the valley in a northeast direction. It's staying nearby, sounds like it's circling, actually looking for something. About three minutes. Pass and suddenly total apocalyptic cacophony of a minigun, shit you not, erupts. Sounds right next door. They had this thing spinning for a solid 30 seconds while strafing a target, presumably. We were all in utter disbelief. Once the sound stopped, we heard the rotors of the helo heading back towards that supposed base. I was out driving the rural Pennsylvania logging roads and backwoods around my college late one night. I couldn't sleep because of the oppressive heat of late August in my dorm room. I figured some spirited driving and the AC would relax me. I didn't have class until 6 p.m. the next day so I had plenty of time. I turned down a logging road I had been down many times before and kept going. It was about 2 a.m. and I was in motoring bliss. Music was playing and it cooled down enough to have the windows open. I make a couple more turns then I see someone standing on the side of the road waving. Being naive and overly helpful I slowed down, turned the music off and stopped to see if they needed help. As I pull up it looks like a man with grey hair and about late 50s early 60s. The odd part was he looked straight out of a 1930s depression era picture, just in color. When I asked if he needed help he said he was just walking to town and told me to be safe. I started driving on for about 10 minutes when I slammed on the brakes. There was no town of any kind for 15-20 miles. The only towns in that area we abandoned when the mines left at the turn of the century. There had been one in the area because that was what my research paper was on the previous semester. Slightly rattled I chalked it up to the late hour and continued down this road knowing I would come to a main road back to campus in about 10 miles. About 5 more miles down the road, walking in the same direction, same side of the road was the same man I had seen earlier. This time I slowed a bit, music still off, as I went past he looked over and started shouting, they're coming. That was that hammer down the next five miles to the main road and all the way back to campus. Illegally parked my car in the staff parking so I wouldn't have to talk across campus at night and went to bed. Next day paid my parking ticket and tried to forget the whole incident. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes. Midnight Central Time.